Welcome to worship here at Minnehaha United Methodist Church. We are delighted that you are joining us, however it is that you are joining us. So for those of you sitting here in the lawn, that's so awesome to see you all. And what a change from, you, from uh, last week's weather, right? So it's nice and warm. You can use your bulletins to fan yourself if you need to. Um, I also know it's really windy, so we're going to get a lot of wind noise across the microphones. and. Uh, the musician's music is probably going to fly a lot, so they'll, they're on top of that. Anyway, uh, but it's great to have you. If you are here or if you are worshiping with us online, you're going to need a bulletin either way. So if you're here and you need a bulletin, you'll find it at one of those two tables over there. And if you are online, you will find the bulletin attached to uh, our website. You'll also find it as a link on the email that you got. And if you are not getting our emails and you would like to, please let us know that you would like to be added to the list. You can just send us an email at office at minnehaha.org and we'll go ahead and add you to that list. Uh, just a couple things. Uh, those of you in the lawn, you may start getting texts from friends who are used to worshiping um, online, letting you know to let us know that it's not streaming right now, and we know that. So, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, we are recording it, however, we will upload it uh, as soon as we can, but we're having an issue with the streaming connection this morning. So, not being streamed, but it is being recorded. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, just a bulletin, you got that. Uh, the playground, just a reminder, as appealing as it is, uh, please leave it uh, empty during the worship service and after the worship service, or probably more appropriately, after Sunday school, then the playground is available for folks to use. And Jenia, do you want to say a word about Sunday school? Yes, so we had a wonderful week of Sunday school last week, and we're looking forward to doing things in very much the same 
way we did last week. So that means at 10 o'clock, um, when, oh no, it's 10 o'clock right now, at 11 o'clock, when worship is over, kids, we invite you to come gather up here in the front. We'll get Sunday school set up in the lawn behind you while you do music with Eric and Julia. And parents, while your kids are in Sunday school and other adults who still want to linger and visit, we encourage you to do that over by the patio so we can get Sunday school set up in the lawn. Great, thank you. Um, and just a reminder for adults that uh, adult faith formation, Matthew Palumbo is incredibly apologetic. He keeps having schedule interference. Uh, it will start in October. So adult faith formation will start in October. Um, meals on Wheels. A lot of you know that we provide drivers for Meals on we Wheels about once every seven weeks. And this coming week is our week. And a number of our drivers are out due to medical issues this coming week. And so Rachel Larson has reached the end of her calling list and the end of her rope. Yes, Conrad, she found someone. All right, so find, find Conrad, who is just raising his hand. If you can drive on Friday, we, we need, yep, one hour, one hour commitment around noonish on Friday. So if you are able to drive this Friday, see Conrad so that Rachel can get that settled and be feeling a little more comfortable as she goes into surgery this week, which I'll bring up during the prayer time. So just uh, need drivers for that. And then, Julia, you have something else that's happening this week as well. Yes, I do. You might have noticed as you came here on the lawn that something is a little bit different. Right over here in the tree, we now have a fairy house. There's a fairy door right there. If you haven't checked it out, take a look on your way off the lawn. This isn't the whole announcement. This is just my precursor. There's a little a bell you can ring to see if somebody's inside. There's a little door you can open. There's sweet grass inside so that if a fairy chooses to live in our house, they can have a comfortable home. We are going to dedicate this fairy house among many other fun activities on Wednesday night. It's the night, it's the day of the autumn equinox and we're having an autumn gathering and fairy night here on this lawn. A um, lot of fun activities planned. This event is for families, but it's also all ages. So if you are a grown-up, you're a teenager, and you think it's groovy to meet a real-life fairy, because we've arranged for one to come, or if you think it's groovy to um, write down your hope and wish for the season and throw it in a fire and watch your wish go up into the ethers, this is the event for you. If you want to come and have pizza, a picnic um, out here on the lawn prior to the actual start of the fairy night event, um, you can do so, the, the, I think the deadline is tomorrow, right? To register online for pizza, just so we know how many people to expect. So it's a 5.30 pizza picnic. There's also gonna be fairy bread. If you've never had it, here's your chance to try fairy bread. They used to offer that to the fairies. Um, and then starting at six o'clock, we'll have our dedication and continue with our evening of activities. There's crafts. Um, as I said, there's a fairy going to be there. We're encouraging you to dress appropriately, whatever that means for you. So you can be a magical being of any kind, or you can do a nod to the fairy folk. Um, anyway, we hope to see you. If you, have, if you have any questions, ask anyone on Children's Council or me or Jenya, and uh, we'll happily get you your questions answered. I'm getting really excited. It's going to be a great, great playlist with music and stuff. So hopefully you can all come and make it. Thank you, Julia. All right. And then just one other thing to have on your calendars. We're going to finally be able to do the memorial that everybody can attend for Laverne Mitby, who died last year. And so Laverne Mitby's memorial will be here outside on Saturday, October 9th at 11 o'clock. I'm saying that looking around like nobody knows that but me. Um, so I'm going to say 11 o'clock and I might be wrong. Uh, but we'll have that in the e-news and it'll be in the bulletin next week. But uh, late in the morning on Saturday, October 9th. And then that's an opportunity for, this will be a time for everybody to share stories that you might have about Laverne, memories that you have about Laverne. And then there'll be refreshments afterwards all out in the lawn. So also pray for good weather that day so that we can indeed be outside. All right, Renee, you look like you have something. Well, it's, uh, 
it's mini harvest again this Saturday. It, it just rolls around really. It does, like it's every fourth Saturday or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah, once a month. And uh, even though it does say in the bulletin that we will be in the Fellowship Hall gym and kitchen, um, if the weather holds, we will be out here. Uh, last year we came inside once. Otherwise we made it all through the winter with being outside. Uh, and we'll try and do that as long as we can this year. Um, so, and so what is Mini Harvest, Renee, for those who don't know? <laughs> okay, Mini Harvest has been going on for over 20 years, and it's a time when we have a small truckload of food. We'll have about uh, six to eight pallets, you know, pallets, that, 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 of food that will come, and it's mostly produce. We almost always have onions and potatoes. Uh, we've been getting a lot of apples this year, um, sweet potatoes, a lot of other kinds of produce. Uh, we do not get cabbage anymore because they inundated us with too much cabbage. But anybody can come and pick up food. No questions asked. The only thing we do is we tally how many people we give food to because Second Harvest wants to know that. And we get the food from Second Harvest for the Heartland. It arrives here uh, somewhere a half an hour either way of 7 a.m. on Saturday morning. I know on a Saturday that's a little, little early for a lot of people. But that's okay. We start distributing food as soon as we've got it out. So we start distributing at 7.30. And we will be distributing food until 10 o'clock. So, you know, if you roll out about 8 on a Saturday, and decide, well, gee, you know, I'd like to do something that helps the community. We'll take you. You can come and you can help us. We'll have a job. Uh, we start cleanup at 10 o'clock, and uh, then it will just look like we weren't even there, except for maybe there might be some food on the corner. But if you have a need for food, or you know somebody in your neighborhood that has a need for food, please come. It's free. And it's just one of the ways, besides Meals on Wheels and the food shelf, that Minnehaha takes care of the people in the neighborhood who may be um, a little bit on the hungry side. And the statistics coming out from Second Harvest say that one in eight people in Minnesota doesn't have enough to eat. So think about that. One in eight people in Minnesota doesn't have enough to eat. And some of those people that have enough to eat don't have really good food. And this is good food. This is produce. So please come join us at work. Um, pick up food, whatever. But, um, you know, it's all possible because of the members of this congregation. So right. thank you very much. Thanks, Renee. And if you come at 7 a.m., you can watch the sunrise as well. It's really beautiful. <laughs> so, right, just an right added bonus. Truck. Right, right, right over the truck. <laughs> exactly. All right. The rest of it, I trust you to read in your bulletin or look at your e-news tomorrow, which will have all sorts of other details. But for now, we're going to continue with worship. So if you would please rise in body or spirit for our call to worship. And God created the heavens and the earth. And God breathed life into each of us and set us upon the earth. Everything that fills our souls with gladness and light is a gift from our Creator. In our hymn, you'll find the words right there in your bulletins, is praise the source of faith and learning.
about the rest of you, but about two and a half weeks ago on a Wednesday night, my family saw a beautiful sight. It was right before dinner time. I think there was like 2% chance of rain. And we were sitting at our kitchen table eating dinner and we looked out and rain was pouring down. And so we looked at another window and there was no rain there. And we looked back and yes, it was raining. And for the next half an hour, it depended on which window we were looking out of, but it was raining and it was not raining. And then as we were leaving to come to confirmation here at church, we saw a beautiful rainbow. Did any of the rest of you see that rainbow? It was a couple Wednesday nights ago. And it wasn't just one rainbow, it was a beautiful double rainbow. And you could see it if you were in the right space, you could see the beginning and the end. And the bottom rainbow, the one that was super bright, almost looked like that was a double rainbow itself. There was so much color in it and it was beautiful. And I have to say that what I think was even more beautiful was that as we were driving over here to church, we saw countless people standing in their front yards, having pulled over and getting out of their car and looking at that rainbow. And knowing that people all over the city were taking time to see that and to appreciate how beautiful it was. And knowing that to make that rainbow, we needed both the rainstorms and the sunshine. It was a beautiful thing to see. Now, as Julia mentioned, Wednesday is the autumnal equinox. That is the day of the year that starts the season of autumn or fall. It's the day when we're going to have equal number of daylight hours and nighttime hours. And then our days are going to start getting shorter and our nights are going to start getting longer. And during this season of fall, most of us change our habits some. We might have to turn the lights on in our house a little earlier than we did when we got up in the summer. We might have to keep lights on later. We might light candles to bring us that light and warmth. 
And this, as the nights get, get longer and the days get shorter, we think a lot about what we can do to bring light and warmth to the world. So this is my challenge for you this week. Thinking about that rainbow from just a couple of weeks ago, taking time to stop and appreciate the beauty and the hope and the goodness that is in the world. But also as we start off this season of autumn, what can each of us do to bring light and beauty and goodness and hope to the world? And sometimes that might be as simple as pulling over the car and pointing out to the people who are sitting in the car with you, look, there is a rainbow, there is hope, there is goodness, there is beauty. And sometimes you're gonna have to create it ourselves, but that's something that we get to do together as a community. At this point, I would like to invite you all to spread a little hope and love and peace as we share the peace of Christ with one another. If you're able, I encourage you to get up, to stand around, to look at who's come in since you've sat down, and to wave a greeting to them to share the peace of Christ with our community. I invite you to stop waving at one another. I know. You, never mind. I take that back. You can wave at each other all you want, but we're also going to turn to our intentional time of prayer together. And so in a moment, I'll invite you to share with one another joys and concerns that you might have. You'll also see a list of people at the back of the bulletin, people that actually on the second to last page of the bulletin, uh, people that we are holding in our prayers. And you see there that a very long time member, Audrey Damon, did die a week ago today. And so prayers for her family as they sort through Audrey's things, but also sort through their grief and a, a lifetime of having known Audrey and also all of you who are her friends. Her memorial service has been set and we will put this in the e-news for tomorrow, but it will be October 30th. So the day before Halloween on a Saturday and it will be at two o'clock in the afternoon because Audrey was not a morning person and neither is anyone in her family. So it'll be at two o'clock in the afternoon uh, where we will celebrate Audrey's life. I also ask that you hold in your prayers Brad Pedersen, who is currently in the hospital. So in case you're wondering why he's not sitting right there like he normally is. Uh, Brad, we think uh, the issue is that he had gallstones that then blocked his bile ducts and so he got uh, a gallbladder infection. So he's pretty sick, uh, but Hopefully that's the thing that it is and they'll be able to solve it, but he is currently in the hospital and they're working on fixing that. But prayers for Brad and prayers for his whole family uh, as they sit and, and wait for news from the doctors. Also prayers for Rachel Larson, who is anticipating hip replacement surgery. You, you've noticed that Rachel has not been here and she's had a really hard time walking around and it was sciatica and it turns out it was, it was her hip. So they're going to replace that hip and she is really hoping that this solves her mobility issues and that she is able to get up and around and do all the things that she is used to doing. So prayers for Rachel, prayers for Conrad as Rachel is in the hospital and also prayers for good recovery for Rachel. And then Jan, you asked for prayers. You're gonna be meeting with uh, an oncologist, right? To start the treatment whatever around your breast cancer and whatever that looks like. So we'll hold you in prayer as you make all those decisions and as you start whatever that course of treatment is. We also are keeping in our prayers Anne Willette. Um, for those of you who don't know who Anne Willette is, you know her grandmother, Donna Smith. And Anne was here with her whole family at the beginning of the summer. She lives in, with her family in South Africa and she works for UNICEF, but they were uh, in the United States for much of the summer visiting with family. Her mom, Kathy, also comes here on a regular basis and has asked for prayers for Anne, particularly in this next week. 
Anne's job with UNICEF this week is to go to a small village in Qatar, outside, just outside of Afghanistan, and to help all of the UNICEF workers there set up a treatment center for traumatized children coming out of Afghanistan. She will not be there a terribly long time and then she will return to South Africa, but her heart is heavy with that work um, and ask for all of our prayers for the safe travel for her there and back, but also for all of those who are going to be continuing that work and for all of the children who are coming out of Afghanistan incredibly traumatized. And so we hold all of those in our prayers. And so do you have joys or concerns things that you would like us to be holding in prayer. And if you do, just raise your hand. And I'll try to come close and listen. Are there others? Yeah. Continued prayers for the Haitians who are in Del Rio, Texas. We used to live there so well for now you're with the bridge. So forth, but there's about 14,000 of them in the room. Yeah, exactly. So Marshall asked for prayers for all of the Haitian refugees who are sitting right now outside of Del Rio, Texas, and you used to live there, yes. so you know exactly what that looks like. So indeed, prayers for for all of those Haitian refugees and for people the world over who find where they live to be untenable and are trying to escape it, and just all that that happens along the way of that. Yeah. Are there others? All right, well, holding that in our hearts. We also hold in our hearts medical staff around the country. We've been hearing reports already of how hospitals are full um, and just the reports from folks who've had to go to the hospital this weekend. We know that our hospitals right now are full as well, um, just with a wide variety of folks. And so prayers for all of our medical staff and all the medical staff everywhere who are trying to help make good decisions and triage and sort through giving everyone the kind of care that they need. And so holding these and many other things in our hearts, let us join our voices together in our morning prayer. Caring and compassionate creator, we enter this place set apart for your worship, knowing that we have failed to see you in other places. We have ignored your beauty around us in earth and sky, in plants and creatures, in the people who surround us. We have chosen to live more by our fears than by our faith, to be weighed down by what we do not have, rather than rejoicing in your gifts to us. In these moments together, draw us so close that we cannot help but know every day that you are with us wherever we go. Enlarge our capacity to care, so that we may see you in all whom we meet. Amen. And let us be in a time of silent prayer. O oh God, you are right in our midst. We know you in the sound of airplanes going over, and the sound of a red squirrel chattering, and the sound of the wind blowing through the leaves. Oh God, we know you in the murmuring voices of the people who surround us. We know you in the murmuring voices of all of those whom we encounter in our lives. Oh God, help us to see you in all those places, and help us to recognize your presence even as we are asking for it, even as we are asking for your care and your comfort, even as we are asking for your healing and your justice and your hope. Oh God, transform our lives, even as we ask for the transformation of other lives and of your whole world. Be in the midst of us, as we gather all of our prayers together in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, our Creator, God in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson today comes from the third and fourth chapter of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is evil and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in the peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourself therefore to God, resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. Draw near to God, and God will draw near to you. May God add blessing and understanding to this reading. Amen. Please rise and body your spirit for our hymn. to us. Meddling, that's what that is. James is always meddling. Because he comes and he says, who is wise? And a few people, who, I'm wise. And he says, well then, show it by your good works. You're like, okay, I'm taking my hand back down again. He says, but if you're really about selfish ambition for those good works, it's going to show up. Not good enough. You have to do it for the right reasons. 
Real wisdom, God's wisdom, will eventually show itself through the way you do things. And then he points out, where do those disputes come from? Assuming, of course, that there are disputes, because there are always disputes. Where do they come from? Well, they come from something you want and you don't have, and that's why you do these things, so stop it. He says, just ask God. Oh, but if you already asked God and it didn't happen, it's because you're asking for the wrong reasons. Ask for the right reasons. And by now we're thinking, okay, I'm, just, I'm done reading James. I mean, my goodness, it's just poking us all the time. And so maybe you missed the very end of that passage because you were already really annoyed with him. James essentially says, in the end, it's not about us. It's about God. It's always about God and not about us. And we get it wrong a lot. But the fact that James is even providing this information to us means that the author of James has hope for us. That while it's not about us, we can. We have the potential to align ourselves with the things that God wants. So James has made it clear that what we say and what we do and what we believe need to be aligned with each other because what we say and what we do and what we believe matter. And so we're going to look at those, some of those things that we believe this fall. Today, are we inherently good or inherently evil? That'll be fun, right? You're enjoying this so far, I can tell. Um, Next week, we'll talk about prayer and whether it really works. And then, do we really see everyone as a reflection of God? And then we're going to look at Jesus' humanity and then at Jesus' divinity. So, inherently good or inherently evil? This comes up, it's now <clears throat> in Christian theology, it is called the concept of original sin. James doesn't use those words because the concept doesn't exist yet at the time that James is writing. The concept of original sin is not written into the Bible. In fact, most theological concepts we have are not specifically written down. It's not like you can point to a verse. It says, oh, look, right there. It says that God created us with original sin. No, it, it's not there. None of those theological concepts are there because we are all doing what theologians have done for centuries, which is we read the Bible and we look at the world around us and we try to make sense of it. And when we put those things together, it's called theology. Most theology comes from interpretation. Interpretation of the Bible, interpretation of the world that we live in. And that's why in the United Methodist Church, very little of our theology is written in stone. Because it's always changing. Because our understandings of God change. Because the world we live in changes all the time and so theology is a it's a living thing it's malleable it moves and sometimes we discover something new and we say wow that that messes with a theological concept i had and maybe that theological concept needs to shift a little bit so original sin Theological concept that came about in the late 300s and early 400s from Augustine, Saint Augustine, if you're Catholic. Augustine, like all of us, was not perfect. Uh, he was exposed to Christianity, but he preferred to follow hedonism. I mean, who doesn't, really? So he did. He followed hedonism. It was all about himself and his needs and his wants. Um, plus he came, did I mention this? He came from a very wealthy family, very high social economic class. Um, so he went off to school, as you do when you're in that class. And when he was age 17, when he was at school, he met this woman. And uh, she was not of his class and his mother did not approve of her. And she said that he should not marry her and he should not take up with her. And so he only listened to half of what his mother said and he didn't marry her. But he was in a relationship with her for 15 years. They had a child together until finally he gave in to his mother. She arranged 
an appropriate marriage for him with someone of the appropriate class. And he ended the relationship with this woman and he sent both her and his son away. He was also in the process of giving up hedonism and turning toward Christianity. And so he ended up never marrying that woman that his mother had found for him. He instead chose a life of celibacy, he became a Catholic priest. It's only Catholic in these days, that's not like a choice of Hmong denominations, it's we're all Catholic in the 300s and 400s. And so he, he had some issues that he needed to work out and he never again had contact with that woman that he had lived with for 15 years, nor with his son. And so his choice in celibacy, some see as uh, problematic. But at any rate, he wrote a lot of theology. A lot of the theology that we have today within Christianity has its origins in Augustine. He was, he was bright and he was a thinker. And he really was trying to put together what he read in the Bible and what he saw in the world around him. So, to get to original sin, we have to back up from Augustine. You thought we'd already backed up to the 300s, but we're going to back up even further. So, baptism, remember last week we had a baptism? A baptism originated in the Christian church really early on, and it was how you joined the church. So, when you, as an adult, decided that you were going to turn from whatever else you had been following, you were then baptized into the church. And so, those baptismal vows were the vows you take to join Christianity. It's why you say things like you renounce sin and evil and you turn toward the church and you become a part of the church. And it was an adult ritual. It was something that adults chose to do. But then pretty early on in the life of this young Christian church that was forming, there was a plague. The plagues were fairly common, happened periodically. Um, this particular plague affected infants, again, as often happens. So it's not like the infant mortality rate was really great before, but this plague was coming through and wiping out children. So everyone worries about their children, and everybody worries about the afterlife of their children, regardless of the gods or God that they follow. And so there was a solution for this among those who followed the Greek and Roman gods. And it turned out that in that tradition, if you are worried about the afterlife of your child, there is a simple way to guarantee the afterlife of your child. All you have to do is sacrifice them. And so if your child begins to get sick, and they're going to die anyway, then you sacrifice your child as a preventative to make sure that their afterlife is guaranteed. Converts to Christianity at this time were coming predominantly from those religions, not so much from Judaism anymore. Judaism already had a huge culture that was anti-child sacrifice, so that was not coming in to the early Christian church. Instead, it was coming from this understanding. And so Christian converts were converting right back to pagan, and I say pagan not in a derogatory sense, but just like that's the description of the, of the religious practice of that time. So converting back to pagans because there was an option for their children in paganism that didn't exist in Christianity. And so the early church did what the church is actually good at sometimes, and it adapted. And we took that baptism ritual and instead of having it as a ritual that you use when you join the church as an adult, they moved it back to infancy. And so you didn't need to sacrifice your child just because they started coughing. You could baptize your child. Now the church was not flexible enough to change the vows. And so you still took vows that renounced evil and sin and parents said them on behalf of their children uh, and set it for themselves. And so you renounce the evil and sin of your child and you baptize them. And then later, your child could join the church on their own. 
which now we call confirmation. You confirm the vows made at your baptism. So how interesting we're talking about this today because last week we had a baptism and next week we're going to celebrate the confirmation class and some of them are going to join the church. And here we sit in the middle, which is kind of how this came about. Those two things used to be the same thing, but we became flexible and we separated them so that there was an option for parents so that they would know that their children were always going to be in God's hands. But then a couple generations pass, and as happens, after a couple generations, we kind of forget how that happened, and you've got parents who are standing up there with their brand new infant, standing up in front of a church, renouncing the sin and evil of their infant. And they begin to ask the questions that all of us ask, which is, really? The sin and evil here? Why? How, how would my child be full of sin and evil already? So Augustine has an answer for that. And like many of his time and times since then, he starts with his own experience. Uh, so when he was a child, he had a very memorable experience. He writes about it later in his adulthood, so obviously kind of a searing memory for him. He and his friends were out playing, and they saw that their neighbor's orchard had ripe fruit, and there was a big wall, so clearly they weren't supposed to go there, but they did anyway. They climbed over the wall, and they stole the fruit, and they weren't even hungry. They just stole it because they could. And Augustine said, even as a child, I was depraved. I stole fruit I did not need. That is evil within me. And if it's within me, it's within everybody. How did it get there? He reads through his Bible. Oh, you know who else stole fruit? Adam and Eve. God created them good, put them in a garden, told them not to eat of this tree, and then what's the next thing they do? They eat of that tree. And then they're kicked out of the garden. That original sin is then passed down through all of humanity because we are all related to Adam and Eve. So that's why you say those vows at baptism, because your child is born sinful. That sin of Adam and Eve, it just it got into our DNA. He didn't have words, DNA. He didn't know that. But it got into us. It became part of who we are. And so we are born sinful with a depraved mind. Given the option of stealing fruit from our neighbors, we will always do that. And so your work as a Christian is to resist that desire. And baptism is how we acknowledge that God and Jesus came and acted as a barrier to prevent that original sin from staining God so that we could still be in God's presence, even though we have original sin. Right, it's kind of, kind of convoluted. There's an entire book you can read about this from Augustine if you really want the entire set of his thinking. And later, when we talk about the humanity and the divinity of Jesus, we'll touch back on this again. But let's just leave it at that. That original sin, he said, is how, is why we have those words at baptism. So it doesn't take long for people to start thinking, well, if the child is born sinful, how does that happen? Clearly because the birth canal is dirty. So who has birth canals? Women! Guess who's dirty? Women! I mean, that didn't take very long at all, right? Exactly. You knew that was coming. And then, well, how did the child get there? Oh, you know what else is dirty? Sex. Because that's how the child got there. So, therefore, we're all depraved, hopelessly depraved. All of our desires are depraved. Anyway, so you begin to see the path that we go down with original sin. A few hundred years later, people are kind of tired of that path. And we begin seeing what James has been pointing out to us, that what we believe matters. When we believe in original sin, when we see ourselves as depraved, that's what we look at. 
that's the perspective, that's the lens through which we look at the world. And quite frankly, it's not hard, right? If you put on that lens of we're all depraved, I bet if I asked you to raise your hands and tell me something that you saw today that was depraved, you could come up with something, right? We've seen something evil happen today. I mean, it was maybe just a little evil. It wouldn't have had to be very big, just like someone not paying attention at a stop sign or someone who said something rude or a thing you heard on the radio or the existence of climate change. I mean, it really, it doesn't take much, right? We can see plenty of evil in the world. But I wanna make an argument against Augustine, and I am not the first one to make an argument against Augustine. Which is then maybe that wasn't the right lens. I mean, it solved the question of why we have that vow at baptism, but couldn't we have just changed the vows? Like, maybe that would have been the better thing to do than come up with an entire theology that justified the vows. The United Methodist Church doesn't use those vows anymore. I mean, we talk about turning from sin and evil, but when we ask parents baptismal vows, we're asking about their faith. We're not asking them to answer on behalf of their child. We're not saying that those children are depraved and evil. We're saying that we live in a world where evil exists, and as we offer our child for baptism, we're renouncing that, and we're going to do everything in our power to orient our child toward God. We're going to do everything we can to do exactly what James says, turn to God which is where the right wisdom comes from. You ever done that thing, you know, where you're walking down the sidewalk or, heaven forbid, driving your car, or in my case, riding your bike, and then something catches your attention and you look at it, and then that's where you go, right? We all do that. It's normal behavior, and the fact that I step off the sidewalk sometimes is surprising because I wasn't paying attention to where my feet were going, I was paying attention to what my eyes were looking at. So what are we looking at? Are we looking at the evil and sin of the world? Or are we looking at how, in creation, God made us good? Because that changes where we go. What I'm looking at is where my feet are going. So am I looking at that rainbow and the hope and the beauty and the joy? I mean, I acknowledge that there's plenty in the world that does not have beauty and joy. But what am I actually looking at? And I think James, before the concept of original sin was ever there, I think James is encouraging us to look at the rainbow, to look at the positive in the world, to look to God, to God's wisdom, to what it is that God wants in the world. Does God want evil? No. God wants the good. And so, James says, orient yourself to that. Align yourself to the goodness of God. Align yourself to the things that God wants to make better. Is there still evil? Sure, there's plenty of evil in the world. And will we sometimes act out of our own selfish ambitions? Oh, probably. But when we do, we are not lost forever. James reminds us to just reorient ourselves. Look back at God. Make better choices next time. After all, we are God's creation. We are created good. We are created for good, and we are created to work for good. Amen. I invite us now to participate in our offering, and you get to participate in a wide variety of ways. None of them involve touching an offering plate. So uh, there are buckets. If you're here in the lawn, there are buckets on the tables, and you can always leave an offering there. If you are worshiping with us online, and if you are in the lawn, there is a QR code on the back of your bulletin. And point your camera phone at that, your phone and camera at that, and that'll t link you to the online ways that you can give. You can also give through our website. But however it is that you are able to contribute to the mission and ministry 
of uh, our congregation's work in the world. We invite you to do that, and we thank you for the ways in which you live your lives generously. We offer our joy and thanksgiving for you, O oh God. Have blessed us in mercy and wisdom, opening us to reason, gentleness, and purposeful service. May our work for you bear good fruits, and these offerings help to accomplish the tasks for which you have called us. Amen. So just a couple of reminders. Uh, Children will come up here. Adults, you'll move yourselves and your chairs off to the edge so everyone else can set up for Sunday school. Um, and the, the 
the brain cells work to remember when Laverne's services, but not to turn on my microphone. So anyway, um, so that's that problem. But Laverne's service is at 10. I did say that incorrectly. October 9th at 10 o'clock. I just, anyway, it's a long story. So as we go from this place, God calls us from this gathered community to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ in the world. We are to bring compassion, love, and justice for our neighbors and ourselves. So go, live in the world, be in the world, and know that God's spirit goes with you and abides with you. Amen. Shack and